A very good morning to all you lovely people who've joined us from various parts of the globe. Namaste, salam alaikum, warm greetings to everyone on behalf of Team Dentist Channel Online. Today is the seventh day of the biggest virtual implantology event of 2020, and it's been a wonderful experience to be a part and moderate these six days of this wonderful arena. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ruben Lobo and I warmly invite you to the next session wherein we have the singing dentist. I'm joking, looks like a singing dentist, but he's much more than that. And he's not just a implant logist, he's a mentor, he's a guide, he's a friend. And of course, he, there's one special thing that the next speaker Dr. Islam has is that smile. You can clearly see it on his face. He's so excited, so energetic, and he's all set to deliver his power pack presentation, a short introduction about Dr. Islam. Dr. Islam completed his master's degree in oral surgery from the Alexandria University in the year 2014. He's a member of the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry. He's a fellow of the International Congress of Oral Implantologists. He's a fellow of the Alexandria Oral Implantology Association. He completed his bachelor's in the year 2001 from Alexandria University. Currently, he is the founder, cosmetic dentist, and an implantologist at Real Smile Dental Clinic, UAE. Ladies and gentlemen, without much further delay, presenting and giving you an opportunity to listen to Dr. Islam. Presenting to you, Dr. Islam Live. Hi, Ruben. Thank you for this uh, nice introduction. Actually, I'm very happy to be here with, uh, with you in Dentist Channel Online. And uh, let me share my presentation. Can you see the screen? Yes, sir. Please proceed. Okay. I will start my uh, presentation with uh, a simple question, which I believe everybody here is for it. What's dental implant? Uh, of course, I'm not here to tell you what's dental implant, but let's think what's dental implant to our patient. The patient comes to the clinic seeking for a treatment. He don't know dental implant. He don't know crown and bridge. He just want a tooth. And he come ask the dentist for this service. But to give the, the patient this service, we have to understand that the implant is not only a, a screw that we just put it in the bone of the patient. We have to think more further that this screw should be stable, should be able to uh, hold the crown or the bridge or the denture later on, and should be nice for function and aesthetic. And that's take us to the osteointegration. So the osteointegration is a very simple word of what I make implants there. So this osteointegration, which is the uh, connection of the bone uh, around the implant surface. And uh, this allow the uh, implant to be function in its position. We can Say it in another word, it's that the osteointegration is the implant stability. And so on, we drive, divide the uh, implant stability into two kinds of uh, stability. The primary stability, which is the mechanical stability, which is the, uh, the stability once we place the implant in the patient's bone. And it depends on uh, a lot of uh, factors. First is the implant shape, size, and geometry. The placement technique that we use to place the implant, the stiffness and uh, the density of the surrounding bone. The other type, which is the secondary stability, or we can name it the biological stability, which is the changes around the implant. From the day one that we place the implant in the bone, okay, that start to have bone formation around the implant, 
and we can name it as the remodeling and the new bone formation around the implant. So the secondary stability is basically integration and formation of new bone directly on the implant surface. If we look to this graph, we can see as the primary stability starts from day one, it starts to decrease by time. And in the same time, the secondary stability starts to increase by time. So can we measure osteointegration? Actually, we can measure stability by what's so-called ICQ. And the ICQ, we can measure it by a device that makes uh, some kind of resonance wave. This resonant wave can be applied to the implant uh, by connecting a small head to the implant piece. And this will be reflected back to this device. Okay, give us a reading. This reading, okay, can be ranged from zero to 100. The more that we go till the 50 and above, that's mean that the stability is there. These devices could be like an Austin device or Penguin device. And nowadays it's very uh, helpful to be used for uh, every single uh, implant procedure. Another way to uh, measure the uh, stability of the implant, which is the insertion torque. The insertion tool that we use to place the implant in the position could give us a very uh, informative uh, points about how is the boom uh, quality, is the implant is stable or not. This comes by a tactile sensation of the surgeon while he's placing the implant. But sometimes it gives a uh, false uh, reading or false feeling when the implants start to touch the cortical bone apically or uh, in the uh, implant neck. So by both of them, we can have an, a, a reading, okay, to tell us that yes, we have enough stability for this implant or no. So what is the key of success for implantation? This will be a big question. We have to think about a lot of things. We have to think about aesthetic, function, cost, prognosis, the time that we are going to give the patients, difficulty that we have during the procedure, the skills of, of the surgeon uh, and the patient expectation. And the last point, it's one of the most important points, patient expectation. Just short story, I have one patient came to my clinic, he asked me for fixed prosthesis. And when I start to diagnose the patient, I found that he is completely dangerous. So I start to talk about implant. And suddenly I found the patient looking to me and telling me, look doc, I don't want the implant. And I said, okay, so that's mean that we are looking for removable denture. No doc, I don't want removable denture. So I start to ask, okay, so if you need fixed prosthesis, so that's mean that we have to make implant. Otherwise, it would be a danger. You know what was the patient's answer? Doctor, open your books, you will find a solution. It's a funny thing that patients don't know and it's our part to inform the patients what we have to do and to learn them that this is for their sakes. Okay, so the treatment plan is the most important step in the whole procedure. If we plan from the beginning right, we will reach till the end result in a way that will be happy for us and the patients will be happy. So I believe that failure to plan is the failure to, is the plan to failure. As a case I present to my clinic for uh, having the final restoration. And once I saw the patient, I found that these two lovely implants staying together, kissing each other. Okay, now if we look to the case, we have defect in the soft tissue, defect in the bone and choosing of the wrong size of implant on this situation. So I was trying to, uh, to help the patients. We first discussed to remove the implants and to try to start from the beginning, but the patient was very 
uh, strict and he don't want to have any more surgeries. He said, look doc, I have get enough. I need just a tooth in this area. So the solution at that time was to keep one implant sleeping and use the other implant to have such kind of procedure, which is not the best treatment for the patient, but this is what we can do in such a situation. So we have to think a lot before we take a step and touch our patient. We have to think about the bone. Do we have enough bone? Do we need to build more bone? Is the bone quality is okay for placing our implant and so on. The other thing you have to think about is the soft tissue. Do we have enough soft tissue? What kind of soft tissue that we have? Do you have thin biotype or thick biotype? How is the attached gingiva? Do you have enough attached gingiva? All the research is so that not enough soft tissue around the implant that will lead to bone loss and in the end, bad result. Again, what's the kind of the implant that we are going to use? What is the position of the implant that we have to place? So a lot of questions comes in, uh, in this point and here we're going to talk about the implant position. We have to put the implant in a 3D position. As I said from the beginning, that the patient is not seeking for implant. He comes to the clinic seeking for a tooth. He don't care how we do this tooth, how we place the implant, which technique we use, what kind of implant that we do, but all what he is looking for is a tooth for function and aesthetic. So I will summarize the position of the implant by uh, simple words. Whenever we have a situation that placing an implant between two neighboring teeth, we have to keep 1.5 to 2 millimeter mesodistal between the implant and the tooth. We have to place the implant and leaving a gap three millimeter between each implant. And when we place the implant, uh, epically, we have to keep like two to three millimeter from the cemento enamel junction. One more important thing that we have to keep in mind that we have to keep two millimeter of facial bone one to two millimeter of palatal bone in the state to keep our implant safe. This is a minimum of, uh, of millimeters to have our implant safe. Another thing that we have to talk about is the timing of the implantation. A lot of time when we start seeing the patient, first let's see, are we going to extract the tooth? So if we extract the tooth, do we have enough bone to go for immediate implantation, which at that time would be the best choice for the patients from every point of view. The bone is there, the soft tissue is there, so we can place the implant in the right position and build up the uh, jumping gap by artificial bone. And at that time, we can put even the implant in function. But of course, it depends on the situation of the patient. So what if we can't make the implant in the same uh, visit of the extraction? Let's say the patient have some kind of infection. So at that time, we go for early implantation. As it's between the four to eight weeks after we extract the tooth, we can curate the area, leave the soft tissue to heal from four to eight weeks. And at that time, we can enter the place and put the implant in early time. And again, it's a, a better uh, choice for our patient. Then we have another uh, timing, which is after 12 weeks, it's almost three months, which called early implantation. This is uh, the, the situation where the bone is partially mineralized, not fully healed, but at that time, the bone reduction start to occur. So most of the time from 12 weeks or at least three months, two thirds of the width of the bone start to be reduced. Or we have the delayed uh, or late implantation, which is actually after six months. Okay. And at that time, the bone is fully healed. 
So what if we see the patients after six months? What uh, suppose we found? Most of the time, after six months from the extraction, reduction in the ridge dimension take place. And most of the time, this comes buccally more than lingually. And this is uh, supporting the theory of bundle bone. Uh, after removing the tooth, the bundle bone is gone. And as the bundle bone is gone, bones start to resorb. And this will lead us to what we called narrow ridge. So what is the treatment option for narrow ridge? We have a lot of treatment. Uh, we can go for guided bone regeneration. We can go for ridge expansion. We can use small diameter implants. We can use osteodentification by using VersaBur, which is, uh, it's a play, uh, it's a game changer actually. Once I use it, I, I found that I was missing a lot of, uh, of fun. Uh, we can go for ridge splitting, or we can combine one of all what we said before. So let's talk about GPR. I'm going to pass by uh, fast in this area, and we discuss that more on the uh, clinical cases. So we can go for boom blocks. It could be artificial boom block. It could be Hury technique by taking bone from, uh, let's say, retromolar area. We can use titanium mesh with different shapes, size available in the market. We can use uh, titanium reinforced membrane like uh, PTFE. We can use tenting screws or we can use resorbable membranes and all combined by particulated bone. Another way is to make ridge expansion. We can use osteotomes, which I tried before. It's uh, technique sensitive and the patient doesn't feel comfort while you are hammering him. Uh, you can use manual expansion. And I was lucky to use uh, this kind of expansions in my master's degree to expand uh, the bone. And you can use the rotary expanders. We can use small diameter implants. Some companies provide us with uh, this kind of shape of uh, uh, implant. As you can see, the implant looks like the expander. It's narrow from the apex, and then gradually increased in size. And uh, we can just place the implant in this uh, position and the implant itself make the expansion. I try actually uh, this implant long time ago and uh, I believe it looks uh, fine for a uh, single tooth replacement in, uh, let's say, anterior uh, region. Or we can go for osteodensification using Versadrills. And this Versadrills uh, was invited by Salah. Actually, I'm not the speaker for uh, Versa, but I was introduced to uh, these drills by one of my uh, colleagues. Dr. Ihab Rashid, he was uh, the first to use these drills in my region and he told me, why not you try this? It's, uh, it's very nice uh, drills. And actually I was wondering what kind of drills that will make a difference. But when I start to uh, search about it and I try to uh, take some kind of, uh, of courses for knowing what this kind of drills do. Uh, so this drill is actually uh, cut in a normal way, but once we return uh, the, uh, the direction of the movement into uh, anticlockwise, it starts to condense the bone, making what so-called uh, osteodensification. By uh, pressing the bone together, making more uh, size in the bone, make the uh, cancellous bone more tough, it increased the quality of the bone and at the same time increased the uh, thickness of the bone. So 
as I said, it was a, a game changing in my uh, uh, career. And I'll give you an idea about how we can use these drills in uh, expanding the reach. It was recommended by the company uh, that we use it when the ridge is four or uh, or equal four or bigger than uh, four millimeter. At least we need to have two millimeter cancellous spoon, one cortical bone on each side. We have to use the burr in or the drills in small increments. We have to oversize the osteotomy uh, to be wider or equal the implant diameter. We have to uh, make the osteotomy one millimeter deeper in, than the implant lens, especially in the mandible. And we have to use these uh, drills of a speed between 800 to 1,500 RPM with a copious irrigation. As these drills move in its place by pumping action, okay, we can increase the thickness of the bone, expanding the bone, by pushing the uh, cancellous bone toward the outer side, okay, and this gives more strength to the bone and increase the size of the bone. We will come uh, for some clinical examples to show this later on. And one more thing to be mentioned here that every implant system have uh, like uh, a short we can download this chart from the Versa site and we have to follow this chart. Let's say an example, I want to place 4.0 millimeter implant. Uh, so I have to start first with the pilot drill if I'm going to use it in a soft moon. Then I have to go for drill number 2.3 millimeter, then the drill 3.0 and then I go for placing the implant and so on. So for every system, there is a shot like that. We can download it from online and follow it. Other technique is ridge splitting. And we can do ridge splitting uh, with different tools. We can use scalpel, blades. We can use chisel, diamond discs, burrs, micro saws, piece of surgery. And my experience was in chisels and uh, piezo surgery. And I think that the piezo surgery is a very interesting uh, tool to, to do such kind of procedure. So what is the indication for rich splitting? When can we say that we can uh, split the ridge? First, we have to have sufficient vertical height with uh, a distance away enough, safe distance away from the mental nerve or the inferior alveolar canal in the lower uh, jaw. In horizontal, the effect should be with a wide base. So the base of uh, the jaw should be wider uh, than the apex. As we can see in the, uh, the graph here, the base is like uh, wider from down than uh, tapered on the top, so like uh, uh, a triangle. We have to have at least one to two millimeter of cancellous bone. We have to have one millimeter cortical bone buccally and one millimeter cortical bone lingually in a way that we can split uh, the ridge. The ridge width should be equal or bigger than four millimeter. Uh, it's uh, important to say that splitting is more technique sensitive in the maxilla due to the, thickness, the thin of, thinnest of the cortical plate of the maxilla, which can uh, lead to fracture of the cortical plate in the maxilla. And when we place uh, implants and making splitting ridge, the more number of the implant that we are placing, the more we facilitate uh, the ridge splitting. And this is the uh, piece of device that I uh, use with this kit for uh, splitting of the ridge. Uh, this kit have different uh, tips. Every tip have its own function. 
the first tip for cutting the horizontal line, then it goes for uh, widening it and widening it, then the, uh, the tip number three for placing the vertical cuts. I will show you uh, now like a small uh, animation to explain uh, the procedure in details. First of all, we have to check the patient, do our comb beam CT. I think we can't go for splitting the ridge without proper scanning for the patient. First, we have to raise a full thickness flap. We use the first tip, which is the CS1. We use it between 80 to 100 with D3 motion and we start to place our first cut. We have to keep moving while we are uh, cutting the bone. Don't stop as stopping will make crazing in the bone temperature and this will lead to death of the bone cells. Then we go for the uh, tip number two, which increase the width of the, of the cut. And we have always to cut uh, away from the neighboring tooth by one millimeter. Then uh, tip number three for placing uh, the vertical cuts. This is as the protocol of uh, this system. We cut one millimeter away from the tooth, as I said, and directly from up to down. We never stop, we keep moving. As the machine is working, we produce water for cooling. And after we finish our vertical cuts, we go to expand more and more the cortical plate. Every single tip comes with bigger diameter that we can allow us to use the elasticity of the bone, widening the bone and splitting the ridge. So tip number five and then tip number six. Very important uh, thing to be mentioned here that we have to uh, know from the beginning the limitation of the technique, how we are going to use it, and what is the diameter of the implant that we are going to use, so we can know when we are going to stop. Is it the time to go and drill the final place of the implant? So we have to plan everything prior to start. Then after we finish the, the final tip, we go and place the implant final drill, and then we install our implant. Then we can use particulated bone, cover all with membrane, and close our surge. So what's the grafting material that we can use? The grafting material, it could be arograft, which comes from the patient's own. It could be intraoral or extraoral. Intraoral, we can uh, take it from the chin, the retromolar area, the uh, tiprosti. Sometimes we can use uh, scrubbers to take it from the same side of the, uh, of the surgery. It could be allograft, which is tissue formed from same species. It could be phrase dried bone or demineralized phrase dried bone. It could be xenograft, which is a uh, tissue forms from other species as bovine bone or procedure. Or it could be alloplast, which is completely synthetic, like tricalcium phosphate, hydroxyapatite, or calcium sulfate. So let's now start about clinical cases. My first case, this was a case that done a um, long time ago. 
the patient was uh, presenting to me with uh, a problem that he had a uh, Maryland bridge in the lower uh, lateral tooth. And uh, it was annoying him in his tongue, always falling down, uh, come several times to repost it. And then when I check the, the place, I have very narrow space, mesodistally. And again, I have very narrow uh, ridge baculingually. But this space is very hard to go for splitting and very hard to, uh, to expand. So you open the flap and I take the challenge. I use here narrow diameter implant. This is uh, Xive 3.0. Uh, it was actually a challenge to place the implant in such position and I was managed to place the implant with a complete of implant threads inside the bone. Then after that I start to graft the area. I used here uh, alu graft. Then I cover it with a uh, resorbable membrane and I close the case. And after healing, you can see the difference of the place. It looks more expanded. I start for the second stage, taking the impression. And we start like that, as from the beginning, and we end like that. Another case, which was uh, upper uh, missing premolar, you can see uh, how the defect in the bone here. And I start to plan the case. I took impression. I start to wax up the case. At that time, I wasn't using uh, comb beam CT. I plan the, the case on the model and with uh, OPG, I make sac down tray over my wax up and I start to raise my flap. First of all, when I put uh, the first incision, I try to make the vertical incision to allow me to, uh, to uh, stretch my flap. And very important point here to uh, mention, when we put the vertical incision, uh, it's very uh, helpful to put the, uh, the blade with 45 degree on the uh, tissue. This will allow for uh, less bleeding and uh, it makes the healing better and it makes the flap close much more easier. Then after that, we raise the flap. I release my flap uh, from the beginning and this will allow some time for hemostasis to happen. So when I go for placing my uh, boom graft, it would be uh, easy with less bleeding in the sides. I start for my first drill. I check the position. Everything was good. I replace my implant. And again, I was lucky that I placed the implant totally in the bone. Then I fix my membrane, place uh, the bone graft. And here I use, uh, again, aloe graft. I like to use aloe graft uh, in most of these cases. And then I go and stitch everything in place and then you can see after healing, we can appreciate that we make a difference in the, uh, in the site. But again, as much as I augment before, I was thinking that this will stay, but the more that you wait, the more that you lose bone. And in such a situation, yes, we gain some millimeters from the, the bone graft that we did, but still, we still have some kind of resorption. Now we finish the case. We go for case number three. And this case have a very nice story as she was just a young kid when she presented to my clinic. It was uh, 16 years old. 
which is actually very young to go for uh, an implant and she have some kind of uh, malocclusion. So when I saw the patients, I asked her for uh, CBCT, which I checked that the bone is very narrow. So I know that at the time of the surgery, uh, it will be even more narrow than that. So we go first for some Invisalign uh, correction for the situation. It goes by 14 aligner. We make the place of everything in a better uh, place. This took from us almost a year. Uh, the patient have some uh, kind of feelings and things, so we work on that. So till the patients reach 20 years old, we start at that time to think about, okay, maybe at that time we can plan for our surgery. At that time, we go for another combine, we check the bone, we still have narrow bone, not big changes, maybe the orthodontic treatment uh, play some rule here to keep everything in position. I choose to go for guided surgery in this uh, case to place my implant in the most favorable position as it's in a central incisor. So I was trying to place it in a way that I can have a uh, nice procedure later on. Then I use uh, this kit from NEOS. Start the drilling techniques, placing step by step till we reach for the implanting position. Then I start to augment my case. So here I have the implant in a nice position. I place my boom graft, my brain, I over augment the area as I know that I'm going to lose some of this size by time. I close everything after healing, then before placing the final uh, procedures, the patient was asking me to have a better smile. So at that time we go for uh, preparation for the neighboring teeth, crowns in the areas that need crowns and uh, veneers for the other cases. And this was the case starting from here. Then we reach it here. Then and another case represent to my clinic. And actually it was uh, the wife of one of my friends, which I was actually very, uh, let's say, very unhappy to work for her. Because, you know, when you work for relatives, almost the complications happens. But when I have the CBCT, I found that, yes, it's another challenging case. I have a narrow ridge. The ridge is 4 to 3.9 in most of the areas. And here, I take a decision to open and use the vertebrae. I put my first drills, check the parallelity, and I start using the Versa drills to expand the ridge. As you can see here, how we can get like one to two millimeter more. And I could place in the ridge, which was starting by four, 4.2 millimeter, uh, an implant which was uh, four by nine. And in the posterior, uh, and this the posterior part, 4.5 implant. And we always, when we place the implant, I like to go with this uh, drill, which called bone mill, to make sure that we don't have any kind of bone uh, higher than 
the surrounding of the implant profile. So I can place my abutment and the healing abutment uh, in position, as you can see here. Then I think I have here to go for some bone augmentation. And I choose here to use synthetic bone graft, which doesn't need to membrane. And this actually was my first time to use this kind of bone. But I think it, it works in a pretty nice way. Then I release my flap lingually and buccally in this situation. Then I close everything with PET, uh, non resorbable sutures. You can see the x ray after with the bone graft in place. After healing, two weeks healing, we remove the sutures. Most of the time, we remove the sutures from 10 to 14 days. And two months and a half healing, we start the second stage, taking impression with close technique here, checking the shade, and now the final procedure. You can appreciate here how much expansion we get by using the versa drills. Only by using versa drills and some uh, particulated bone overlaying uh, the buccal area. And as I said, this was a game changing in my practice using such kind of drills. I learned from long time, every time and every step that I do, I have to confirm my work with an X-ray. And here, once I take an X-ray, something looks wrong. I believe my prosthesis is not in the right position. So I check what was wrong, and then I reposition my prosthesis, screw it, and everything in place. I was lucky to follow up this case for a couple of years. Everything looks stable. And you can see we start from this situation and we reach to that one. Again, very challenging case. As in this case, an old lady just came to my clinic asking me to change for her her prosthesis. And upon checking, I found everything is moving. She saw that the bridge is moving, but actually the teeth holding the bridge is moving. The gums is inflamed, separations come from everywhere. And after checking the CBCT, I found that I have infections under the teeth, very narrow uh, remaining bone around the roots. They don't have problems with the lens, but it's narrow uh, bridge. I removed the old prosthesis, as you can see the situation, and then start extracting the teeth. And I took a decision here to keep everything for healing, for two weeks, I go a bit fast in this. Now, I reopen after two weeks. You can see that the gums looks better. And I start using Versa drills to place my implants. So I place the implants in the favorite position, depending that uh, the drills will make osteodentification for uh, the socket. Of course, I start to uh, drill after making curatage for the uh, fibrous tissue that was formed and granulation tissues that were formed after the extraction. I check the parallelity. Everything is good. I start to augment. I use here, uh, again, our uh, synthetic bone graft. I close everything, leave it for healing. Two months healing, we re-enter, put the healing caps.
and then we adjust the heating caps to uh, make it easy for the patients to use the denture as uh, she don't want to go without this. I took after one week impression using open tray. Now we can appreciate how healthy is the tissues, the position of the implant, and then I try everything with this uh, resin key. I have the abutment connected to this key as it is the framework so I can check uh, the path of insertion for it before asking the lab to go for the final procedures, which looks like that on the model. Then you can see and remember how it was before, and that's what we reach after. Another case, and this would, will be my final case. I will end my presentation with it. It looks a narrow ridge then again in the combi CT. Wow, it's 2.7 millimeter, 3.3. So I have to choose here the treatment option very carefully as it's only single tooth. So there is a big chance if I go for splitting technique that I will lose my buckle plate. So at that time I have to be ready for a plan B. And I took here the, the way by uh, splitting the ridge using uh, the first tip by the piezo, make the first cut. And then I use the second tip to widen. Then I jump from two to four, as I don't want to make here uh, vertical cuts. But after I reach to 1.8 millimeter of splitting and expanding the Ridge, I go and I combine this with Versa drills and I start to osteodensification in the ridge, placing the position of the implant. And we have to keep in mind that every time we go for ridge splitting, the implant tends to be more lingualized. So we have to put in consideration this in the uh, final uh, procedures. As you can see here, the ridge after splitting and osteodensification, I manage to put 4.0 diameter implant, 4.0 by nine, completely embedded in the bone. I get the benefit that I don't have any threads exposed. And I go and you use Asus Boom Graft to rebuild uh, the contour of the ridge. As we can see here, I release my flap, lingually and buckly, and I close everything. And then two and a half months of healing. You can see the re-entering using the healing caps. I use some composite material to uh, adjust the uh, emergence profile. Here, how it looks like after. And then we can appreciate uh, the changing in the width of the ridge. And this is the final situation. We take the patients from here till here. And thank you.
the first question are sleeping implant does the sleeping implant further leads to bone loss as my knowledge there is no research showed that sleeping implants are uh, led to bone uh, resorption um, most of uh, the cases uh, that have been placed implants and left for long time uh, we can go and found the implant is uh, in the same position with the same bone around the implant All right, thank you, doctor. We move to the next question. Which is the most common complication associated with rich split osteotomy procedure? Uh, the most complication procedure is losing of the buckle plate while uh, you splitting the ridge and placing the implants. Uh, a lot of times that uh, the buckle plate uh, get fractured and lost. That's why we always have to, uh, to go for plan B. And this is, happens a lot in maxilla more than the mandible. As I said in my presentation that in the maxilla, uh, the cortical plate is very thin. So this is, uh, mostly happens in the maxilla than in the mandible. And it happens in single placing implants than uh, more uh, than uh, multiple implants placing uh, in the uh, ridge. So when the more numbers of the implants, one or two implants, the more the wider the distance, the less complications of, uh, of this. Sometimes bone resorption happens around uh, the, uh, the neck of the implants. Uh, and that's why sometimes we like to place our implants uh, more deeper, uh, not flushed with the, the bone, more deeper than the, uh, the ridge to accommodate any uh, uh, marginal bone loss uh, later on. Thank you so much. Doctor, we move to the next question. Can you please share some tips of, for management of lap closure and expansion of ridge? Mm. Uh, look, most of the time when we uh, make expansion of the ridge, uh, we have to make some releasing incisions. Uh, we release the preosteum by a uh, scissor, blunt scissor or by scalpel. And uh, new technique, which actually I did not try it yet, which is the brushing technique. Uh, uh, which was in, invented by uh, Dr. Chukrun, the same inventor of the PRF. Um, actually, I ordered it and uh, it should be there soon. Uh, this could help to uh, release the flap so we can have much more tension-free closure. Uh, most of the time when we make uh, bone augmentation, okay, I try to uh, have the first uh, stitch by a uh, horizontal uh, matrix suture and they always take it uh, from away. Uh, it goes from down, then up. So we say it uh, epically horizontal matrix suture. This hold everything in position, prevent uh, the tissues from moving. And in this situation, uh, the graft will stay in position and we are not going to lose it. As we all know that uh, most of the time, uh, the first problem in the grafting is the micro motion, motion that happens by the movement of the lips or the cheeks. And uh, if we just keep this all uh, secured, uh, the graft will stay and we will have uh, a nice uh, uh, bone augmentation. Thank you, doctor. Uh, before we move to the other questions, there is a very common question which says, doctor, your presentation was Wonderful. I would like to be a part of a course if you are conducting. Are you conducting any courses, Dr. Islam? Um, actually, I'm involved in uh, an implant diploma. I'm a clinical instructor in uh, 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 implant diploma. Uh, this is uh, organized by uh, CAP um, and uh, Tepton uh, Institute. It's happened here in Dubai in Ajman University. Um, actually, for the the situation of the uh, COVID-19, you know, COVID uh, it was uh, postponed and we're going to uh, restart again uh, from next month. Um, I'm not sure actually about the new program, but this is the, uh, re the continuing of the uh, new program. I wish, of course, to have all of you, whatever he wants to come to, to visit us in Dubai, they're most welcome. Uh, we'll be uh, very happy to see you all. 
Thank you, Dr. Islam. Friends, so everyone who's asked me that question, there were about 10 questions which said, uh, uh, can you please tell me about uh, Dr. Islam's courses? Please do stay in touch with Dr. Islam. He's very active on social media. He's very active on his uh, uh, email ID as well as the WhatsApp number. If you wish to uh, know more about his contact details, you can get in touch with us. Or I will request Dr. Islam to type it as well a little later. Please do stay in touch with Dr. Islam. He would be more than happy to welcome all you lovely people to Dubai for his courses on uh, various aspects of implant dentistry. We move to the next question. What is the least thickness of bone uh, we can uh, use when doing bone splitting? Um, this is a very actually tricky question because um, most of the time, if you want to be safe, uh, choose a ridge which is uh, between five to six millimeter. But sometimes we go a bit uh, crazy, let's say it like that, and we split uh, even 3.5 millimeter uh, ridge. So if we have one millimeter buccal uh, cortical bone on the buccal side, one millimeter cortical bone on the lingual side, and one to two millimeter of uh, cancellous bone in between, uh, I think you can split the ridge, but you have to know that this will uh, be suspected to some complications and you have to be ready for that. But if you want to be safe, you can start by six millimeter uh, ridge. Thank you, doctor. Next question. Doctor, what's your take on re replacing accessible ATS with shorter implants in case of opposing natural occluding tooth is present? No, sorry, sorry. Again, the question. Okay. What's your take on replacing accessible ATS with shorter implants in case of opposing natural occluding tooth is present? Um, I don't think I get the question right. If I get it right, that means that... Uh, I would request uh, the person who's asked the question, Dr. Sachin, kindly put your question, reframe it nicely and please reshare it. Thank you. Next question. How is the primary stability after osseodensification? Will it give good bone to implant contact? Um, I will ask. I will answer this question in a, in a different way. Um, last week, I have a case that I was placing a normal implant uh, in uh, the position of lower six, and I was thinking, why not I change my uh, drilling technique and I use uh, the Versa drills? And I will tell you something. It was very hard to place the implants. So the answer is yes. Uh, Versa drills uh, it increases the primary stability uh, so much, and when you uh, place the implant, you will feel that definitely. Um, sometimes the insertion torque uh, could reach 100 uh, newton centimeter to put the implant in position. Thank you, doctor. What if the cortical bone fractures during splitting? What? What if the cortical bone fractures during splitting? Okay, so you are talking about now Blam B. <laughs> so Blam B, uh, most of the time I prepare myself if there is a fracture for uh, the cortical plate, I have uh, my uh, fixating screw kit and it will take the case from splitting case to let's say a Hori technique uh, case. So we can use this uh, plate as the plate that we prepare in Khori technique. We put the drills in the position and then screw everything in place and then particulate the bone. At that time you can place, the, still you can place the implant at the same time, but it depends from where you start. If you start from a very thin uh, ridge, so at that time you just fix the plate, put bone graft, cover everything with the membrane and then cover everything with the tissues and wait for healing. But if you uh, have, uh, let's say, bigger ridge, like um, wider than six millimeter, I think you can place the implant and then place the, the bone graft and fix the, the cortical plate again. Uh, other option is that sometimes it happens that we go for uh, bone augmentation and leave the, uh, the place uh, for healing, then we replace the implant later on in another stage. 